The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, everybody, good morning. This is Dave Press with Sterling Systems along with Chad Studer. Uh, we will get started here shortly. Just uh, want to let everybody know if you have any questions. Everybody is on mute right now, but if you could please type the questions on your box on the right-hand side. Uh, we can definitely see those, and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Uh, we're going to give it just a couple more minutes. We said we're going to start at 11 o'clock, and we still have some stragglers coming in here. So um, uh, thanks again for coming, and we'll talk to you shortly. Thank you. All right, everybody, straight up 11 o'clock. Uh, thank you again for coming this morning to uh, part three of four on our Civil 3D WebEx training series. Um, uh, again, we appreciate it. We hope that you're finding these, uh, these seminars well worth your time of attending, and uh, we really appreciate you uh, giving the time this morning. So, again, this is uh, Civil 3D Converting Data. Um, basically, uh, just a little bit about Sterling Systems. Uh, Sterling Systems is located here in, in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. And uh, we uh, specialize in the AEC industry, which is architectural engineering and construction. Uh, we also do the Leica product, as it shows there in the corner. If you're familiar with any of the HDS scanners, uh, the high-definition surveying scanners and software, um, I'm going to talk just a real quick a little about journaling systems and, uh, and some of the things we offer. Just one or two slides here. Uh, some of the services obviously provide Autodesk software, we're talking about. Uh, implementations both on the Civil 3D side and the Revit side. That could be things like helping you create your styles, uh, helping the company get up and running to make your projects look uh, distinctly of your own, and uh, and to get Civil 3D as far as training, support, things like that. Consulting services, uh, working with the different uh, software programs that are out there, products like Navisworks, working with Point Clouds, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, training solutions. Uh, that's on-site uh, in a classroom setting. You can customize all of our class our classroom trainings to fit your needs the best. And support solutions that uh, via phone, email, or what they call virtual support, where we can take over your machine and uh, and actually see what's going on on your computer from our office. Uh, something really quick like that. And also the like HDS scanning. Uh, we do that uh, on-site training again the classroom on the software on the hardware. Pretty much anything that covers the uh, the scanning of the Autodesk software, we can train and support you for that. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, talk a little bit about Civil 3D. Uh, actually, I'm going to turn this over to Chad Studer. He's going to talk about Civil 3D, the ninth version of, of the LAN desktop software. And with that, I'll turn over to Chad Studer. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Dave. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, again, we're going to talk about converting data in Civil 3D. And for the the people who have just signed up, maybe just for this WebEx, just a, a quick introduction of Civil 3D. Uh, it was more originally DCA, and then they changed the name to SoftDesk. And Autodesk bought SoftDesk, made Land Desktop. It had three modules in it, Civil Design Survey. And it was also built uh, on top of AutoCAD and also had map software, GIS functionality. We're going to talk a little bit about that today as well. Again, you're going to notice pretty much it's not 
quite a big deal in, in this presentation, but if you check out part one and part two, uh, the design interaction and the what if scenario, uh, just to kind of touch on that real quick and kind of what you have to look forward with Civil 3D. Uh, in pipes or in plan view, everything kind of looks the same. Everything's 2D. But when you bring up that object viewer or that 3D orbit and you start working in 3D, your pipes go from a simple 2D to actually seeing 3D data. And you can do clash detection uh, and you can, uh, I guess, it, it, you know, you can take it in Avis works and do the clash detection. Inside Civil 3D, there is a, a command in there that will actually show you your clearances, uh, which does like a little mini clash detection as well. And again, that works for all the different objects in there. You see the fire hydrant. If that's a 2D block, it becomes 3D uh, surfaces alignments, all sorts of things that you can work with there as well. And then, of course, the dynamic what if. Uh, no matter what we do in the engineering world, it's always going to be changed. It's going to be modified. It's going to be tweaked. It's going to be what if uh, scenarios. And the best way to describe it is just move the mouse, uh, move the road, because that's basically what happens. Right? We get the entire road design. You got the profile. You got the design road. You got the cross sections. Everything's done. And then for some reason, we didn't do something that modifies the horizontal alignment in previous software, other software, so you had to go back and redo everything. Uh, not in Civil 3D, you change the horizontal alignment, profiles automatically update, cross sections volumes, all the way through the entire dynamic model will update. So again, uh, Civil 3D has been around now, so it'll be the ninth version. Uh, I actually started back in the days of the, the drafting board and then uh, VersaCAD. The first computer I bought I believe it was a 486 on my own, and people thought I was crazy. I'd never need a 486 computer at home. So uh, things have definitely changed over the years. And now if you're not or haven't heard of Infrastructure Design Suite, make sure you inquire about that. And bundles, different softwares. Now that you start working with construction companies and the architects, uh, you can only manage so much software. So what they did is offer it all into a bundled software package into a suite and you can pick or have Navisworks and Max, and the, the pricing that Autodesk has given or offered this to everybody at, uh, you pretty much receive free software. If you have any questions about that, definitely let us know. This is an example of a dynamic engineering model. Again, the horizontal road, the, the vertical profile. Uh, you have an assembly, or what used to be called a template, your typical sections. You put those three components together. They build a, a 3D road. Uh, output or basically a corridor, as you can see there in the center of the road. And then if you move the horizontal alignment, it would change the horizontal location, move the PVIs or the vertical, and that would move this up and down, which in turn would change all the volume calculations, would adjust all the volume or the, the cross sections over here, would automatically update as well. And of course, all your rim, in, rim elevations would automatically update as you change that proposed surface for that road if the pipes are underneath it. And again, you flip it and you can see in the 3D as well. We also have, uh, once you build your styles, you have rendering tools. So as soon as you design the road, you can have it automatically show your grass materials, your paved roads, your concrete, your curbs. Or again, if a road design is kind of flipped that upside down for a ditch, you have the grass uh, and the different features as well rendered there. And of course, labels rotate at 90 degrees. All the labels update, change the drawing scale. Everything automatically updates uh, for that drawing scale as well. So today, uh, part three, we're going to talk about and discuss here. The, the real focus and the idea of this was to help people that are looking to transition to Civil 3D. And a big issue with that is, well, what do we do with all the old projects? So we want to you know, have a, a focus on that in, of bringing the land desktop data forward into Civil 3D. You can go back to land desktop. It's not a problem. The, the biggest concern would be you don't want to do that constantly. So you don't want to have somebody using land and somebody using Civil 3D. You basically want to take the land desktop project, bring it forward to Civil 3D, and continue working with it. We're also going to talk about multiple formats. So what if your client's on Civil 3D 2009, you're on 2011, or if you're going from 2009 and you just got 2012 and you're going to roll that out. We'll talk about that a little bit, some of the things that, that you'll notice. Going back and forth with AutoCAD users, Revit users, Navisworks users. As I started laying this presentation out, uh, the land desktop part is actually the easy uh, portion of this. And the more I looked at all the import, export, insert, uh, just the different ways to bring data into Civil 3D, it's really incredible. And I've done it over, you know, like I said, Civil 3D just the last uh, nine years. But just doing it every day, you don't realize how many different uh, ways to work with data there are. So I'm going to point out a lot of them. I'm not going to go through all of them. 
but I want to make you aware of it. I want to just give you knowledge today that you know that this is an option or we could do this or you know, let's work with it this way. Again, when you're translating data from one to the other, unfortunately this isn't going to be a lot of fun, so I, I can't do much there. Uh, towards the end, I'll give away a Starbucks gift card again. Uh, if anybody's there from the last one, I will get those out to you uh, today and touch base with you. But uh, keep that in mind. The fun part, I guess, we get the point cloud and LiDAR data. Working with point clouds is pretty inter interesting if you've never done that, uh, the ability to capture those point clouds in so quickly. Uh, if you haven't seen a scanner presentation, definitely let us know. Uh, we do them periodically. Uh, we'll also do a custom presentation uh, if you haven't seen one in the past. And then just something real simple to end things with. If you're a new Civil 3D user, you haven't taken advantage of the Google Earth, you can insert images right from Google Earth. It brings in the surface. And it's a great way to start design for conceptual work. Just real quickly, what, what data is out there available that I can just bring in and, and look at quickly? I assume, unless I really get uh, talking here quickly or really windy, uh, we're going to have Q&A probably in about an hour or something like that. So we're going to end this one a little bit shorter today just because it's only so much fun going back and forth between the softwares. But that gives us more time for question and answers and anything that you guys want to bring up as we go through this today. So to get started, Civil 3D is uh, the primary one we're going to talk about first, and we'll jump to Land Desktop. So prior versions, what are some of the concerns that we have from a prior version going forward? One of the things is in Civil 3D, if you work, let's say the newest release is 2012. One of the competitors, not competitors, I guess one of your uh, team members or someone else in the office is working on a prior version. Well, inside Civil 3D, let me just switch to that for a second. Uh, whenever you open up a drone, you're going to have all these styles over on the left-hand side. If you save back to any prior version, you lose the ability to work with any of those styles in any way. So if you doubt, if you save as to a prior version and give that to a client that has Civil 3D 2009, they will not see any of your styles or be able to control any of your styles. So basically it becomes an AutoCAD drawing to them. So it doesn't do any good to save back to a, a prior version, uh, except that they could see everything if they wanted to or view the objects. They just wouldn't be able to, to modify or change anything in that situation. So the other one you might have concerns of, if you're just going from Civil 3D 2009 or 2010 into the newer versions. So I actually dug up, I believe this might be a 2008 or 2009 drawing. And I'm just going to go ahead and open this just to give you an idea so you're not surprised when you go to uh, open it up one of the older formats. And, you know, they go by pretty much every three years. So 2007, 2008, 2009 would be the one of the prior formats. As you open it up, you're going to get this dialog box, or if a client sends you a draw and you get this, it's just coming from a prior version. So it's prompting you what you want to do with all the VBA content. It kind of, kind of you know, warns you there, VBA is no longer installed in Civil 3D. Well, what happened? I didn't uninstall. Where did it go? Autodesk decided that they're no longer going to use VBA. So this is kind of a warning to any programmers out there that's using VBA that Civil 3D is no longer going to ship with it. So what they're having you do is either design using .NET or C++. Uh, you know, there's, there's other programs that we can utilize. But the idea is if you want VBA, you have to go out and download it yourself, and you can install it in the background. If you do that, you won't even get this dialog box, and it won't even uh, be a concern in the future. Unfortunately, you will notice, in the, you know, if you're working with some of the Civil 3D assemblies and sub-assemblies, that they won't work quite as quickly as it does with .NET. Smaller projects, I've never really seen an issue with it. But as you progress and move forward, you want to get your drawing as clean as possible. So very simply, you can go in here, and every time you open a prior drawing, you can go convert VBA to .NET. Uh, and you don't even have to worry about the VBA. So if this comes up, click on this. The only thing, the only concern you ever have is if you're working with pipes and you have one of the older part libraries, any type of customization you did 2009 or older, it would lose that because it's going to convert to .NET, which is the new parts library. So if anybody's really concerned with that, definitely let us know. And then basically it's going to take all the assemblies and you know, basically sub-assembly, right, the components, and just convert them all to .NET. And then you just save this in the newer version, and you can uh, disregard that in the future and just uh, move forward. So 
So again, very simple. Just want to point that out to you. And this is what you're going to see over on the left-hand side. Uh, if I go to settings, you'll see that we have styles for pretty much every object. Okay, if I do a save as and then open that in 2011, all of these styles will be gone. You just would not view them. So you won't have any of that control. Uh, if anybody's concerned with that, let me know. I just didn't want to open up 2011 just to, just to show that only. All right, so a couple of the other questions uh, I'm working with. Uh, AutoCAD. So what can we do if we have an AutoCAD user in the same location or a different location, either in-house or for a different client? How do we provide our information to AutoCAD users? So there's two ways you can do that. In Civil 3D, you can either do a save as, and the save as is going to allow them to save it as an AutoCAD drawing or to a, a previous version. The problem you run into, and you probably did this with Land Desktop, when you open up a drawing, it says there's no contours in there. <coughs> and the client calls you, they're like, I got your drawing, but I, where's the contours? You send the contours, you're like, I did, but I'll redo it. So you send it to them again, same thing, they call there's no contours. You think they're crazy, you look at their screen, uh, they were right. What happened is in Land, there was newer objects or object data that was not compatible with AutoCAD. Going with Civil 3D, more intelligent objects have been developed, so every single thing in Civil 3D is pretty much an intelligent object. So AutoCAD can't, it doesn't understand those objects. So simply go to Autodesk website. You can go to supports or downloads, uh, and you have to find the object enabler, and they can download the object enabler to see Civil 3D objects. And what it allows them to do is see those, but they can't do anything with them, but that is one option. Same with any of your Revit users. They can do the same thing. If you want to send this to an architect, they just install the object in Neighbor. That's the simplest way to do this. If you guys have any questions on getting the object in Neighbors, uh, shoot me an email. I can send you the link. There's actually a website just for the object in Neighbors, which make it real easy as well. If you have a client and you don't want to spend time, you know, if you tell them about the object in Neighbors, they're never going to get it right. They won't take the time to download it. Or you just don't care what type of data they get. Well, you can also use Civil 3D. And let me open this back up just to, to quickly show you that, that same drawing. The other option that we can do as you're working in Civil 3D is just simply export this to AutoCAD. Again, if you don't want to use a Civil 3D object, so that user is never going to send the drawing back to you. You're just providing them an AutoCAD drawing. That's all that it called for. We simply go up here, and you can do Save As, right? I think we talked about that. Inside here, and you can save it as a DWG or a DXF. A better way to do it is just go to Export, and you can export it as an AutoCAD drawing, and you can export it to the version that they need. Basically, in a nutshell, what this is going to do is explode. Yes, I said it's going to explode every single one of your objects or Civil 3D objects. Uh, you know, basically, the, the surface, I think, has exploded two or three times, so they become just polylines. It's going to dumb down all the objects so AutoCAD users can work with it like a normal drawing. So if that's all they need, that's the best way to get the information to them. Just be concerned with it. If they send you the drawing back, you can't use it. You have to take out whatever they did, all their AutoCAD notes, and put it into your drawing. What I like about exporting this is you still have your Civil 3D version. You just keep working. You export it, and they basically just make it a copy of your drawing with everything exploded, and that goes to them. Hopefully, they do everything on their layers. You double block it out and put it back into yours, if it's even coming back. So that, that's the one of the suggested ways to go to AutoCAD as well. Or if, for some reason, they require a DWF to translate from one software to another, you could do that as well. Also, a couple other formats we'll probably talk about as we go is VGN files. You can import microstation files, export VGN files, and you can even bring them in almost like an X reference where they're kind of like an overlay in the background of your drawing, and you can even gray them out, kind of make them darker or lighter, fade at a fade effect like you do with a, an image or an X ref now, and then you can draw right over top of it, and you can even snap to it, which is really, really convenient if you need to work with those files as well. Again, just as a reminder to everybody, feel free down in the chat window. Uh, there should be a, a comment in there that you can add questions. So as you get going through here, feel free to ask any questions. I'm going to try and take, keep this open and take a look at it as we go. A couple of questions that, that popped up already. 
uh, where are the recordings posted online. Uh, unfortunately, I got very busy <laughs> and I didn't get them all modified or edited to the right format. A lot of work goes into that to be able to post that. So we will get those up there shortly. Anybody that's on the WebEx in the past will get a link uh, as soon as those are up there as well. Uh, one of the other questions, are the styles really gone or just not visible? And when you do a save as uh, to a prior version, all the styles are still there. They're just not visible. So if, as long as you open up that same drawing, they would all be there. They're just Civil 3D newer styles cannot be recognized by older versions. So that's the problem that you run into. But one of the things that I did, I built content for a client, I think it was 2011, and they were like, well, we're going to use 2010. Well, I did, couldn't save all those styles. I couldn't do save as and utilize all those styles for that company. Literally, I had to go back and rebuild all of the styles in 2010 version. Now, they can take 2010 and go to 2011, 2012, and you can always go forward with the styles. They just don't let you go backwards with those. So definitely keep that in mind. And again, I'll try to keep a, an eye on all those questions as we continue. So again, feel free to, to keep posting that as, as we go here. There's a lot of information to cover. Uh, I wish I could make it a little bit more fun for everybody, but hopefully everybody gets a little bit of information out of, of what we're looking for as well. So the next one I want to talk about is importing GIS data. One of the things in 2012, and only 2012, that they came up with, if you have a shape file, so someone has GIS data, ESRI data, and they send you an entire pipe network, hundreds of, of pipes, and you can, you know, basically would be maybe just 2D data that they exported that they have to give you a great start on putting that in there. Well, in the past, you had to select every single line or every poly line, and you had to convert it to a pipe network. This was very time consuming. Depending on what information is linked with that pipe network, if they have start invert, end invert, and all the information is there, it will pull all that information over when you import that file. So I want to just kind of introduce this again. I'm not going to go into great detail on a lot of these things. I just want to show you that it's there and, and what we can do with it. So hopefully you can start utilizing some of these in everyday uh, work world. So as we go in here, one of the things I want to point out was the GIS data. I'm going to simply open up a, a small drawing. <laughs> I also had one that had over 3,000 objects in it. And I started to bring that in, and it was taking, I think I got to about six or seven minutes, uh, and it was just too long. So I didn't want to bore you guys with it. So I'm going to keep this real simple. The idea is you already have an AutoCAD drawing, or you open up an AutoCAD drawing, you want to bring in uh, GIS information for an entire pipe network. And, and really, just to kind of show you that this is available. So under Insert, there's an Import tab right here that kind of hide. And you can go down here and select Import GIS Data. I'll probably come back to some of this in the future, but I want to also point out why we're here. If anybody's built custom subassemblies or used subassembly composer in the past, you can transfer the information from one to the other. We can also do import building sites. Anybody using Revit, so if you're working with an architect, they create their building, they can actually take that entire model export that as an ADSK file, and you simply import that ADSK file, locate where the building is going to go, because we know that they're not going to use coordinates uh, unless we give them the building location. So you can import that ADSK file. There's options uh, as you import that to move it where you want to. And as they make changes, 30%, 40%, whatever that submittal process is, you can simply import that, and it will continue to update your drawing at the same location every single time. You just have to place it the first time. So that's the easiest way to bring in that, that Revit information. For all the users out there with HECRAS, so if you're doing any streams, rivers, uh, water-related calculations, uh, a very simple format. How many Excel spreadsheets? How, much, how many times have you spent converting this data back and forth? So there's a very simple plugin in Civil 3D that you can click and simply import that information uh, right from HECRAS. And a lot of this information, I'm just showing you the import functionality. If you're bringing it in, typically there's a great way to export that. Uh, towards the end, maybe as we wrap up, I'll go to the export tab and show you what, what we can do there as well. And also under the, the import GIS data is where we wanted to go to. So we're going to go ahead and click on that. As it comes up, 
and this is going to be one of the next features that we talk about, uh, is the ability to connect to SEO objects. So in this case, uh, it's kind of walking us through connecting to a, a shape file. There's several ways to do this. This is only for your pipe data. So we're going to go ahead and select on this, locate a shape file. As we bring this in, we'll click connect. I won't go through all the options with you. It's just going to be time consuming. But basically, you, you would name the pipe network just as you would in Civil 3D. So if you draw a line or a power line and you made a network, they're prompting you for the same options here. What part network would you want to use? Uh, what layers would be associated with that? You want it to, to grab the rim elevations from the current surface. Uh, is it associated with an alignment? Just so you don't have to do this later on. And then structure label style. So I have one in here for storm, CST, uh, structure plan, and then for my pipes, I have CST storm plan label. So good, because the styles are already set up in this drawing, which is very important, it's going to automatically apply the styles that I want, all the labels that I want to as well. So again, a little preparation ahead of time, but as long as you have that template created, it comes right in. If you already have a coordinate system set up, you can actually save these and store these. Uh, you see restore the original coordinate system. This one was uh, saved out of a, a different project there in New Hampshire. Uh, what type of uh, shapes for the pipes would I like to convert all the GIS data to? So circular pipes. You don't have to assign all of these every single time. You could simply do this once and then reload that data mapping uh, information. I believe it's an XML file so you can just load it and save it uh, the next time you do this. So General, what do I want to name this? Where do I want to pull all this information from? So there is a, any information that was stored with that shape file you could bring in. So I would just map description to description, name to name. Uh, if there's an ID, I can map the, the IDs as well. Uh, start structure. So we have structure start, structure end. Again, depending on the information available to you. So start invert, end invert. I must have selected twice. There it is, and invert. Star crown. We're not going to sign all these again. Just to save a little bit of time. Wall thickness material. Let's go ahead and just do the inner diameter uh, and assign that to pipe size. There it is, inner diameter. Okay, so you get the idea. And as we click next, uh, again, I should have saved that, so I never have to do that again. It would just automatically map that in the future. Uh, data mapping structures. Again, I could do the same thing. We have the structures and information in the shape file. Typically, a lot of, depending on how big it is, like the one I have is 3,000, I had a separate pipe import and a separate structure import. So in that case, this would have been a different shape file. This would have publicized this one, and I would do the exact same settings I did with uh, the pipes. Uh, we also have some query options to get the information that we want out of certain areas. We also have cleanup functionality. Uh, we know GIS data is not always the best. There might be some overlaps. Hopefully they did a really good job when they exported it or had it cleaned up originally, but we also have some functionality here to clean this up. And then you simply hit finish, and it imports that GIS data, shows you the total number of objects. Uh, again, this one only had six, so it went very quickly, where the other one that I did uh, had 3,000. So I think you get the same idea of pointing across Whatever your settings were for your styles, you have the, the manhole numbers, the color, the style information, and it's all brought in as a pipe network. Okay. And the information now is in the prospector and it was already created for us. So if I go to pipe networks, remember I named that pipe network. Uh, the other one was already in the, the drawing here is the same name, so this is the one that we're looking at. And then you can go ahead and edit that network and you get all the information uh, from that pipe that was applied. There's all the pipe information inside. So we could go back and change any of this and override it at that point. So if anybody's doing GIS information out there, I think you can definitely uh, appreciate that and, and what we can uh, you know, do with that now in 2012 as well. Again, any questions on import that, just let me know as we go on the fly. We weren't happy to answer your questions uh, at the end as well. All 
All right, so one of the other ways of bringing in GIS data, again, that's specialized to, to bring in pipes, the other one is FDO sources. So a little bit of information there. To kind of sum that up, there's a ton of different ways to bring GIS data into Civil 3D. And I know I didn't advertise GIS, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I just want to point it out that it's there. There are a couple of different things. One, you can import. The problem is if you import GIS data, especially ESRI data, if you're trying to work with your firm and they have an ESRI database and everything stored on their map server, uh, you you import it in, you make your changes, you export it out, everything's got to be uploaded back and forth. So it, it seems like every time you import or export something, you lose a little bit or something doesn't work exactly the way you want. So what we can do is instead of import and export, we can actually connect live to the data, even if it's ESRI data on their map server, we can actually edit the data save it and update it back whatever, without importing or exporting that information, a live connection to it. That's what the FDO, Feature Data Objects, allow you to do. So we're going to touch on that, and then we're just going to uh, talk about the import-export and jump to the land desktop information. So we switch back to Civil 3D. To give you an idea, and so everything looks the same as when you go back to your office, I'm just going to start out with that Civil 3D Imperial template. And one of the things that we can do is import or attach to that FDO. This is where we were to import the data. So the FDO data, we're going to use the map information. Simply go down here at the bottom, and we're going to change this to planning and analysis. So think again, in Civil 3D, we have all the AutoCAD functionality, and we have all the map functionality in Civil 3D. So if you want to run Civil 3D with GIS data, Simply change your tool space down here at the bottom, and now, I'm sorry, workspace, and now look at the functionality, completely different tabs at the top, and you're, you're working in a, a map format at that point. So to bring in your FDO data, you simply go to the, the big icon here that says connect. One of the cool features I really enjoy uh, when you're first learning new steps in Civil 3D, is you just hover over the icon, and it tells you a little bit more information about that. Uh, we can also connect to Oracle databases uh, if you're utilizing that as well. So as we open it up, you can see there is a, a wide variety of formats that we can connect to. I'm going to go ahead and I'm not sure what we're going to bring in. Let's see what I got available here. So I'm going to bring in a shape file and we're going to go locate a shape file. Oops, didn't save my path here, so give me just a second. We're going to go ahead and suggest converting data. We're going to bring in a shape file. Uh, does anybody have a suggestion? They have all sorts of information. So maybe we'll bring a couple in, but let's go ahead and start with parcel data. Again, let's do the same thing with storms, water, sanitary, roads, contours, whatever information you have available to you, it would bring it in. So I would just name each one of these uh, unique or project name, however I want to keep that separate from the rest of the information. We'll click connect and what it's going to do is connect to that data wherever it's located and I can simply bring this in to the drawing now. As the information came in, you can see there's information available to me, the California State Plains, if I go back to the drawing, I can actually view all this information now directly inside Civil 3D. And I can continue to bring in another shape file uh, continuously one after another. If there's data associated with the shape file, you can simply select it. And if you go to properties and then bring this out a little bit, you can see it actually has the address there, the street names, anything that was associated with the information that I brought in. And again, this is a, a live link, so I can actually go in, edit this information, move lines, right? Uh, Esri does a great job of storing the data or displaying the data, but if, you, if you're forced to work with that information, we have the capabilities of displaying the information, and we can edit the information. So if you have a CSO 3D, you go in there, use their data, you edit it, and you save it back for them, you'll be the hero. But you can see there's, there's acres, the land value, anything that would be stored. Same thing if I bring in the water, I can have water main sizes, storm sewer sizes, contour elevation, whatever I want associated with that data that I bring in. Uh, and again, I cannot uh, tell you enough that this is associated 
and it's now imported. This is actually a live link that you go back and forth uh, to write this back and forth. To edit the object, you can go back here. You can check out the feature to give you full control over it, over it and then check it back in. Uh, again, hopefully we'll provide some GIS training here in the future if that's a, a topic that everybody's interested in uh, and elaborate that a little bit more. So we're going to go ahead and close that one again. And going back here, so those are SFDO sources and all the different ways of bringing that information and leave a, a live link uh, to the drawing. So if they change that, you can just have it updated. And the other way to bring in information is just using the, the import functionality. Maybe you want to bring in DGN files, Arkinfo, uh, SDF files, a, a ton of information available to us. Again, that is going to translate the information though, from one to the other. So typically, if you can use SDO, I would do that first. And then as a second option, we would go ahead and use the import functionality. So again, so you can go back, kind of do the same process. I'm just going to continue to use that, that same template. And to bring in the import information, you don't have to be using to map workspace. Uh, why I'm switching between workspaces, though, I just want to show you there's a 2D one and a 3D uh, modeling one as well, because you're doing a lot of 3D work. And now we'll go back to, to 3D. And then hopefully everybody's imported data in the past, and it's, it's very simple. Uh, again, a big icon here in the top left. Simply click that. These are the different formats that we can bring in. And there's 3DS. Uh, those are your Max files. Anybody has a design suite, you can work with Max files back and forth. Uh, and talking about Max, you can. Uh, I'll try to elaborate this a little bit later, but Civil 3D now has functionality to have a live link back and forth with Max as well. And of course, you want to bring in the DGN files. We can do that as well. Uh, one of the other uh, information, I guess, is if you want to bring in just the, the shape file as well, we could do that. Uh, typically, you can type it into command line, or I guess I would have to use math for that. So let's go back here real quick, or maybe I overlooked it. I just want to show you where that is. Okay, that was the, the SEO with the connect. You can also go in the pull down here for data, just to show you what's available. So if we bring anything in, you can bring live links in the to map. You can edit data and save it back. Even uh, AutoCAD drawings, all sorts of information there. And to access the rest of the information uh, for the options, make sure everything's working exactly the way you want to for map. Uh, everything's real simple. And then of course to to bring in. Uh, to get back on topic here, that shape file, you can simply go over here. Uh, I'm using the insert tab. There's AutoCAD import, SDF, FDO import. So it would not be the. Uh, this would be the same option I showed you before. This would be the import information, and this would convert the data back and forth. I believe this is a pretty small file, so I'm just going to click OK on that real quick. Uh, as you import a shape file. You can tell what layers you'd like this to be associated with. Okay. You can tell it the data that you want associated with it. So if this came over and you had fields in here with all the different size water mains, it would automatically read that information. And you can connect it to all the AutoCAD information or blocks as well as you bring it in. Uh, this one I know didn't have the data. I just want to go ahead and provide you a little information, a, a preview real quick, uh, how that's done though. So again, very simple in an older way of connecting to your data. But depending on what you need it for, uh, you can do that. So we'll wait for that to import. Is there any other questions on the GIS, GIS information before we move forward and jump into processing the land desktop data? Okay, and we'll go ahead and look at that. You can see that it brought in information as well. Again, if I had the object data associated with it or the shape file information, the other files that have the data, I go to properties and it would have all the different sizes. And again, you can do GIS forever. So the idea is I can go in there and say, give me every four inch water main, make it blue, take the, the six inch water main, make it dark blue, 
uh, leave the eight inch white. So you can color code the entire uh, map by information. You know, let me know if there's something that anybody's interested in. There's a ton of things that we can do with the GIS functionality. But let's get back into working with Civil 3D and converting that data back and forth. So hopefully that kind of wraps up some of the things with, with Civil on that side. So two ways that we want to bring land desktop information forward. Uh, also, there is competitive software that you can bring forward as well, and that's going to be in the, the next option that we talked about. The first option I'm going to show you is inserting land desktop data. There's actually a command that allows you to do this. If you're in land, you can also extract Civil 3D objects. Unfortunately, when I uh, signed up or agreed to present this, uh, I don't have land desktop installed anymore. I think I actually took it off maybe in 2010 or 2011, I think I, I did. Uh, the good idea, the good thing with this option, we don't even need land desktop in the background anymore. We can still bring that data forward. So if we're working with a client that has land, they can just send me their project if they want to, and we're good to go. Uh, and also, the second way of working with this information is they send you an XML file. We can do that as well. So take a quick note there, insert land desktop data. Well, when you do that, the only thing it's going to allow you to do is description keys, surfaces, alignment, parcels, and pipe runs. Anybody think of anything else that you might want to bring in? How about points, right? So it does not give you that option. If you note there at the bottom, uh, it does allow you to do that. Points must be imported from MDB file found in the Kogo folder. So I'll show you how to do that. It's a little second step. And if anybody types in one more feature that they might want to bring in, I'll give you another $5 gift card. You can think of what we're missing on that list. Got to make sure everybody's still awake and paying attention. Make, a, make it a little bit more fun, right? So I'm going to take a, a quick look to see if anybody quickly types that in. So under questions, looks like everybody's sleeping. I don't see anything on that yet. So if anybody gets to their keyboard, feel free to type in what might be missing. All right. Yep, it's profile. So we have to, uh, you don't have profiles on the lens, but it's something you want to convert from land desktop to civil 3. Even though I didn't mention it in there, it's kind of a hidden feature that you want to make a note of as we go forward. So two things to keep an eye on, profile information, and you want to take a look at point information. Let's go ahead and look at this inside Civil 3D. The first thing I guess I'm going to do is, is just to give you an idea. This is kind of the, the part that's hard to understand. There's a bunch of different ways to go about this. So I'm going to go ahead and just open the land desktop drawing directly. I don't really suggest anybody doing this. Uh, if you want to, you could, but make sure you do a save as right away. We we want to leave all the land desktop data in the state that it's in. We don't want to change anything to harm land desktop data, right? We want to always preserve that information. So if we do open this up in land desktop, I'm going to switch to the model view here. And when you open up land desktop data, you have profile information. I have contours, right, because this is a, a surface that I had in land desktop. We have point information, and we have alignment. The problem is Civil 3D is much smarter than land, and it doesn't automatically go find the land desktop data. So kind of like when you open up a land desktop drawing in AutoCAD, what do you have? You have absolutely nothing but line work, right? There's no smart, intelligent objects. There's no project data or project information. So we have to work around that. So when you open up LAN, again, I would take this file if we want to and, and simply do a save as. Or I guess let's hold off on that. Yeah, let's go ahead and save it as. So we'll do save as. I'm going to put this in my new format, so converting data. And we're going to call this new civil 3D uh, drawing for right now. Oops. We'll put it in there and save you can also put Civil 3D on the extension or whatever other ideas you have to make sure you put it in the right location. But if you have Civil 3D projects, you're going to have a GWG folder, and you can put it right in there as well. I'm going to switch back to the Civil 3D location or workspace here at the top. And what you'll run into 
as you're working with this, if we want to extract the LAN desktop information, keep in mind it does not do it from the drawing. And if you open a LAN desktop drawing, keep in mind that you don't have any styles in that. So as I go through here, if I want to look at the surface, I have no surface styles. It was almost like an AutoCAD template. So if we look at uh, alignment, alignment styles, we just have standard. Well, the only thing, this is like drawing a layer zero for everything. Right, no colors, no no labels, no information, everything's just going to be a mess. So it doesn't do any good at that point to extract the land desktop data because it's going to take on the properties of all that information. I'm going to do this a couple times just to make sure that everybody kind of understands uh, what happens. And the, the big thing I want you to know is when you go through this on your own, if you have the same problem, hopefully you'll recognize it. So as I go in here, I'm going to go ahead to insert, and you'll notice a command up here says land desktop, imports land desktop data uh, into the current drawing. If you select on this, again, it's not extracting it from the drawing. So you have to go in here and you have to navigate to the project path, to wherever all your land desktop projects are. Simply select the project that you'd be looking for. Once you find the project, there's all the information associated with it. In 2012 here, it prompts you for what sites. So if you have alignments in different sites, you only bring them all in at once, you can go ahead and select just the site that you want, and it would narrow down the alignment. Alignments can be in a site or no site, so you have the option to say none. So if they're not in a the site, they come in as well. And also with the parcels, if you want site one or various different sites to bring that information in. We browse through here, remember everything that it brings in, description keys, surfaces, alignments, uh, parcels, and pipelines. If it's not checked, it means this project didn't have those features inside there. If you look over to the left, you'll notice there's absolutely no points in the drawing, uh, and there's no parcels, and there's no alignments. The alignments have a little plus sign here, uh, but that's because of the different alignment varies. I'm going to click OK. It's going to extract all the land desktop information. Keep in mind, it's not going to bring in lines, arcs, circles. It's only bringing in the data. It's converting the project, not the entity from the DWG. The description key, surface alignments, and profiles, even though it didn't check it or show you that in the list for profiles, keep in mind that it does do that. So as we click OK here, you'll notice it brought everything over, but everything's kind of white. It's hard to tell what's in here and what, what isn't in here now. So it kind of gets a little bit messy. Uh, in this case, I, it doesn't do points, so I don't have points. But if I take a look at alignments now, we have a list of alignments that are brought in. I go to sites. You can bring in, uh, I'm sorry, the, the parcels. I go a little bit lower. I think it had parcels. Actually, I didn't even look. I guess we didn't have parcels. Double check that the next time we bring it in. Uh, but it did have a surface. So if we take a look at surfaces now, uh, surface definition. There's the name of the surface there, and surface one would be the other one. If we go in there and we want to see the tin surface, the problem is you don't have any style. Okay. So what we want to do, we have a workflow you want to jot down, is a couple of things. The first one is when you start a brand new drawing, you can use your company template to get started. That automatically puts all of your styles into the drawing. Then you can insert the DWG file from LAN Desktop, so that way you're never interrupting any of the information uh, from LAN Desktop. And as you insert this, Another really good idea, as we take a look at the information, and again, this is a block, so this actually helps too right now, so we know which one is civil 3 data, data which one's land. Another really good idea is either open the land drawing and freeze the alignment, freeze all the points, or freeze the surface and the contours, because we really don't need that in this drawing. So a couple options there. Do you want the land desktop information to show, or do you want the civil 3D data to show? So if it's here, we can now explode this and then freeze the alignments. 
or leave it in exploded state, and simply go locate that project data. I'll click OK again. Uh, before I do that, just to point out here, notice there are no surfaces. There are no alignments as well at this point. When we go ahead and import that land desktop data, it creates all that for us. And then again, if you look through here, it says finished ground profiles. So it says alignment and only under alignment. So if it's like this, it doesn't show that it does alignment. But once you look a little bit deeper, you'll notice that this does bring in the profile. And now it takes on whatever your default layer settings, or I'm sorry, your default style settings are. So if I brought in a surface, well, we have under surface, under settings, you have feature settings. So by default, it used two foot and ten foot background is my style. If I, whatever that default was, if I change that to, to design or one and five, then it would update with that as it brought in that surface information. So I can either freeze the land desktop drawing at this point to see what we have for Civil 3D, or we can go back and take a look by whatever we can select on. And we also know by the colors, too, what's in here. So we know this is uh, a Civil 3D alignment, is the green one. So I could double check, yes, that one's in here now, and then I could go ahead and explode the land one and just freeze those layers. What I want to show you here is it will duplicate the data. Because the land does have a simple lines arc circle. So you have to freeze those. You don't want to leave both of those in there. The stationing would also be duplicated, as you can see there. So you want to make sure you get rid of the data from the land desktop one, then import the civil 3D data. And I'm just trying to show you that the land desktop data uh, is still a block, but now look, I can select it. So there's two here. So it did a really good job converting it. You can see there's a little bit of a couple of discrepancies there we want to keep an eye on. Uh, as it brings that surface in, uh, it does use any break lines, all the information that was attached to that. Uh, again, this is client data, so yours should do a, better, a little bit better job depending on what they use to, to make the surface. Uh, keep an eye on that. But I can go simply change the surface information to make it appear different colors. So one in five design, and you can see that it shows up uh, completely different now, and I can obviously see these. I can go ahead and explode the land desktop drawing, and then we could go ahead and freeze uh, the contours because we no longer need those. Oops, I think I grabbed the wrong one, didn't I? I put them on the same layer because it was the current layer. Let me double check real quick. Uh, you guys get the idea. Don't worry about it. You know how to freeze layers and everything. That's the easy part. The problem is if you brought it in, you can see all the land desktop points. The problem is if I go select one of these, they're just blocks, right? Even if I explode this, they just become attributes. So if we select that and I go over to, uh, let's go over to the properties window. You'll notice on properties, there's AEC point, but there's no information associated with it. So it's, it's really just uh, the old information. It's no good to us. A couple of things that you can do to get that point data. If you see it in the drawing and you're sure it's all the points that you need, you can simply go up here to point, and you can go convert land desktop points. There's also convert AutoCAD points. So if we go ahead and select that, you can tell the default layers, point creation, so what styles, what information is going to be associated with it. Uh, we can even add it to a point group. So we could say from land desktop and watch. Here, the points are automatically going to get converted, and now they're part of our drawing. 
So the big thing is I'm going to freeze all the land that's tough ones. Right, these are all switched, again, depending on my style, how they look. You can see how important the styles are. I'm going to go ahead and just switch this to uh, 1 to 40 scale to show you all the, the styles automatically update. But you can see now that these are all civil 3D points. And because I don't have description keys, they went to the land desktop point group. And I could simply change what style that I want to show to display these. So I'm just going to quickly say standard. And it would be nice to have a land desktop. Uh, style in here, so I could choose that if we made one. But in the National CAD Center template, remember the styles don't always look exactly the way we want to. Let me just fix this a little bit just because it's bugging me. So I can edit that style and just change this now to be 0 .001. And all the little X's will go back and they become uh, normal points again, as you can see. Okay. So again, that, that's a style issue, but you can see that now I have converted all of them to civil 3D points. I can look at the list of them in here, and that's one way to do it. Another way, are you sure you can see the trees came in too, uh, if it had the right information uh, associated with it there? Okay. But what you want to make sure of is all the points were in that drawing. What if you open a land that's not drawing, I don't have a third of the points, or maybe just the trees, or maybe just the parcels. So what you really want to do is go to that land desktop project, and we need to make sure we have all the points. So, unfortunately, let me get back out of this one one more time. This is the part that's not much fun for you guys, so bear with me a little bit. Make as much fun as we can. So, again, I have the, the, the brand new drawing here. I'm going to insert the land desktop drawing. Again, you can explode it right there on the left as you do this. Never hurts to see the steps a few times, right? And as it imports the information, again, the same steps, you go up here and import the, the land desktop data. So under insert, land desktop data. After it came in, if you didn't have the points in the drawing, or you didn't think it had all of them in here, then you simply go to points from file. And when you add points, you can simply look for down here the actual MDB file. You might have to learn it's external project database or external project point database. So now when you go to import this, you have to find that project. So I want to go to converting data, my land desktop project. Everybody in Land Desktop has a Kogo folder. There's my point MDB file. This is what you're looking for to bring in every single point from that project. And then when you select that, it has the correct formatting for us. We can add all the points to a point group. And this would be a more efficient and a sure way to make sure you have all the data from the Land Desktop project. Again, just like AutoCAD, there's several ways to do absolutely everything in here. And now it just imported every single one of those points. And as you can see, it looks like we were missing quite a few points uh, from what was in that drawing before. And I apologize, the, the drawing is not super clean, but hopefully you get the idea here what we're doing. Uh, this is real-world information from Land Desktop. Uh, you know, it's not a, a data set or anything like that. It's kind of what I was wanting to show you here. Uh, you can see the points came in. You can also see that it created a point group for LDT as well. All right, so hopefully everybody understood that. That was one way to do it. Uh, pretty, pretty easy, really. I know I showed you a lot of different steps. Uh, but as long as you remember two things. The first one is if you use the Land Desktop data command, it brings in everything but the points. So you have to bring in the point to the bottom to make sure you have all of them using the MDD or simply uh, convert them if you feel comfortable that you have all the points or if that's the only data available to you. The second option that you have available to you is bringing in land XML files. If you still have land desktop on your computer, you can open up any land desktop project, 
simply go to the project pull down, export land XML, open up Civil 3D, import the land XML file, and everything comes in automatically just like it did before there. And this would automatically include description keys, points, surfaces, alignments, uh, parcels, and pipe run. So we'll quickly add this. Again, same, pretty much the same steps. Let me go ahead and uh, open a, a drawing here. You know what, let's do this. Let's just start with a simple template. You guys will get the idea. I'm going to have all my files come in the way that it should because we're bringing 10, 20 projects forward. So I already set up my template. I already know what I want all my defaults to look like. All I need is a land desktop data. You simply go to land XML. I insert the land drawing. So you still need all your line work, all of your text. You still need the DWG itself. And I'm going to freeze the alignment. I'm going to freeze the surface. I'm going to freeze all that extra data. And then when I go to land XML and I go to import it, it's going to prompt me for what I want to bring in. Simply click OK. And it automatically brings in all of the land desktop project data. What's really unique about the land XML information is this would also work with several of our competitors software like Carlson Software, uh, Inroads, Bentley, there's there's all sorts of them available to you. Also, some of my alignment warnings and land were set, so it caused this here, and it's, it's comparing that to the actual standard. So again, that's just a style study, showing me that it didn't meet my current standards for that alignment, and it's flagging that for me, and I can turn that on and off. But otherwise, all the points came in uh, correctly because it did convert it using this step. So it automatically converted everything all in one step. Again, I still have to go back through with all my land desktop drawings and settings, but this is another way to bring that information forward. Now, the other one I really want to point out, uh, even using the other command, is the profiles that you bring in from land are absolutely no good, and you're not going to be able to use them. Even if you can see them, the data is worthless. They're just lines, arc, circles. There's nothing in there usable. So one thing, after you convert your data, you have to go back. And you actually, as long as you have profile information in here, shoot, I don't. I'm going to walk you through the steps instead of going back to the other data set there. But you have to go in here and you have to recreate the profiles. So simply go up here and say create profile view. The information is already associated with it. So create profile view. It'll find the existing surface. It'll find the finished ground surface. And just make sure you click OK. It redraws the profile. It remembers all the information. And then you can draw all of your pipes and profile view. And all of that information was stored in the land desktop data and converted over to Civil 3D. But make sure you remember this step. And this additional step is necessary for both options that you use, uh, option one, land desktop command, or using the XML data. Okay, So just wanted to support both of those out. So what's the advantage of using land XML over the other one? Well, one would be if someone has to create the land XML file in order to be able to use this one. If in 2012 Civil 3D, XML also maintains the fixed free and floating tangency constraint. So if anybody noticed, I had a curve down there on the bottom right, and I didn't have it set right, so it changed the type of curve of how I was bringing that in. And again, it's a new feature in 2012. Land XML is also an advantage. If some reason you have a data that, or a product that was in metric and you want to convert it to imperial units, you can simply export it in land uh, or civil 3D for that matter. Excuse me, export it uh, a metric job as an imperial or export it as metric, and then in civil 3D we import that as imperial, and it automatically converts all of your project data. Keep in mind the AutoCAD information, lines, arc, circles, still would have to be scaled manually. So all the alignments, the parcels, that's really the easiest way ever to convert a project from one to the other. Because it takes all that project data, all your points to the right location, and all the right elevations. So a big advantage uh, using utilizing the land XML uh, for that one. If you don't have land desktop or someone is you have you don't want to open land or you no longer have it installed, but you have the project available to you, then you would use the other land desktop command and you could access that information as well. So I hope that I didn't confuse everybody. I just want to show you there's two options. The biggest thing is to make sure on the first option, convert points, don't forget about them. 
The second one is simply the LAN desktop. And after you bring in the, the points, it converts it. But both options, you still have to regenerate the profiles. Don't redo them. Simply redraw them with the create profile command. All right, so the next one I'm going to take a look at is Civil 3D Point Clouds. This is also, uh, I think, 2010 subscription users. First, we were able to work with it. Then you were able to go 2011. Now, 2012, it is just a normal feature inside Civil 3D. So to take a, a look at this, in Civil 3D, you can go over here, and the way to access that from the Prospector tab is just another object, points, point groups, and point clouds. To get started, to kind of work and show everybody a little bit more information about point clouds, I'm going to open up Cyclone. And while we're waiting for that, I'll just make sure I'm not missing any questions. Make sure I'm staying up to date here. Looks like we're all set. Again, feel free to type anything in there if you guys uh, have any questions. All right, and then for Cyclone Navigator, what we can do is open up. This is uh, on the Leica side. Again, we're a, a Leica HDS provider, so we specialize just in the scanning and the point clouds. In creating those deliverables from uh, out in the field, scanning that point cloud, converting it, or working with that entire workflow through Autodesk software. So what we're going to do is find a simple parking lot, open that up, if you're not familiar with point clouds, it's the ability to capture a lot of data very quickly. So as you can see in the center here, this is where the scanner was set up, and from a single location it does 270 degrees and 360 all the way around. Up to 900 feet from where the scanner sits, it will shoot a laser. Whatever it picks or that laser hits, it reflects back, and it knows where that is in real space. And it will automatically capture that XYZ coordinate. I went a little bit too close there for you guys to, to see that. So what I want to show you is every time that laser hits, it sends back an XYZ coordinate. So each one of these, has information associated down here at the bottom, and it stores the northern, east, and the elevation data. So what we can do is extract all the information from this point cloud. We can make this a, use a virtual survey, or we can make this a field book, and process it in Civil 3D as field book information, and then compare the point cloud to what the survey information was captured out in the field. So a ton of ways to, to work with this information. This is where we took pictures of the site from the scanner, and then from that information, overlaid it onto the scan data. As the scanner works, it shoots that green laser out. Whatever it hits, it returns back a different color. So on the, the paint surface, it's dark. It reflected back the orange, but the paint stripes were a different color, so it reflected back a different color, allowing us to work and use that information and you know, make it available to us. What's really remarkable is any of your street signs will also pick up that information and it's highly used on the architectural side as well. So you can simply then take the scanner and then move it about 250 feet or every 300 feet all the way down a road and capture miles and miles of roadway, uh, all the existing conditions, bring that right into Civil 3D and use that for your design data. We can also change that to grayscale if we want to, so a variety of ways. This is called the, the hue. Uh, colors, and what we're going to do is go ahead and convert this information now so we can utilize that inside Civil 3D. This is only if the only software available to you. If a client sends you a point cloud, let me go ahead and start this export process. I showed us, to, uh, we'll make another one here so you guys know that this is all live. The time that it takes. We'll do HDS parking lot, I like the parking lot, we'll save. Let me make sure there's one there already. We'll just call this training. A couple of different formats that we can push this to. What you want to do for now, format, format that we're going to work with uh, inside Civil 3D. 
So we're going to tell it to go ahead and export everything visible, or we can say just go ahead and do the object type, and we're going to export the port column. So what I want to get to, if you work with like, or if you have a scanner, of course, you guys know that you can use a program called Cloudworks. And it's been around since I've been doing scanning since 1999. And it's a very effective, efficient way to work with your data. And it's definitely what I would highly suggest you look into if you do a lot with Point Cloud. If you only have a project, maybe one or two, or you just need the ability to get the Point Cloud into Civil 3D, this would be a great way to do it. I simply export that as a PTS file. We go back to Civil 3D. Again, just starting a brand new drawing using a, a template. Now we see point clouds. We create a point cloud. And what we have to do is convert this point cloud to Civil 3D format. The different point cloud styles. So it will read the multi-hue different colors. And there's a PTS format, northern, easting, elevation. And then it has the three different colors, blue, red, green. In this case, I want to tell it to bring it in its true color. So it actually reads the colors from the photograph. I tell the PTS format that we want to bring in. We'll go select the new one that we just generated. You see the file size. I know that's going to be a question for a lot of you. If you have uh, multiple files, we can add that to an existing point cloud. In this case, we're just going to add a new one. If we had a coordinate base, we're going to assign that. And then I'm simply going to hit Finish. And what it does, instead of sitting here and making you wait for it, you can actually close this. And down here in the bottom right, it's going to tell us after it's done importing that, and then we can take a look at it. And we'll do that here in just a second. What I really want to point out again is if you're using point clouds long term, there are better solutions. But it's, it's nice to see what a wide uh, range now that everybody is using point clouds, and Autodesk is backing that, and that they now made this just a normal feature inside their program. So give them another year or two, and it's going to be incredible what we can do with these point clouds as far as automating uh, you know, deliverables. We also bring point clouds into Revit currently. Uh, as we bring it in here, we're not going to elaborate on what we can do with it. I'll show you a couple ideas to get you started. And just while that's building, it won't take much longer, maybe a minute uh, or two. It wasn't a lot of points. But I just want to get back to the, the PowerPoint here and keep moving forward. So we imported it. We also have the option to display and stylize it. So what colors do we want the photo? And then we have the ability to modify it. So we can actually go in there and we can tell it to only show 20% of the point or 100% of the point. So we can change the display density to narrow down what information we want in there. And if you guys are definitely going to work with point clouds, I highly suggest you go get free software. At the Autodesk Labs, it's like a beta site. All you do is sign up for it, and then you can go get anything and everything that they put out there and just kind of give them feedback when you can. So one of the things that they offer is point cloud feature extraction. The ability to take this point cloud and actually be able to create point cloud classifications. So if you're bringing in LIDAR data, anybody doing that now or done that in the past, there's no way to manage that many points. They're like, I think artists five years ago was like, well, just bring in one of every 10,000 points. Well, which one do I get? I don't know, just do that. <laughs> and it, it wasn't feasible. So you don't get what you need. Now you can use Micah software. You can import all the information that you want. And you can actually see it visibly, see that point cloud, get the data you want, and extract that. If not, you can take that LiDAR data and bring that right into Civil 3D as well. And I can help you do that if you have questions about it. If you're using LiDAR data, you can do point cloud classification. It actually colors everything automatically by how it was picked up. So it can actually color water blue, trees a certain color. Uh, it's really unique how it knows what's on the ground surface, what isn't. If you bring it in from scanning, we have ground surface creation or from LiDAR. You can literally pick the point cloud, and it will build a surface from those ground points. Typically, to make sure it's working, again, so in the beta portion, you want to kind of remove all the trees and, and just pick the point cloud. Actually, from that point cloud information. 
we can do point cloud segmentation. In other words, build an automatic line in there so we can have a curve, uh, you know, a sidewalk, edge part, top of curve, whatever information we have available at that point. There's also to be able to do modeling from an AutoCAD standpoint as well, so keep that in mind too. So if we look down here in the bottom right, you can see that it did import it. We'll click here to zoom to the, the point cloud. And there's our point cloud inside Civil 3D. Uh, one of the biggest tips I can show you is to take auto regen. Oh, my bad. Thinking backwards today. Regen auto. And we're going to turn that off because we don't need this to automatically regen every time we move it. So now we can move this wherever we want to. We can zoom into the point cloud, and you can see all the information available to us. And it's really a virtual site. You're able to capture everything at that site, no matter how far away it was, and bring that into your computer, and now look at it and take your time to get the information that you need. Or if you miss anything, go back uh, and look at it the, later on. Wherever I move the cursor, it literally displays the elevation of the point that I am over for that point cloud, so you see elevation uh, 15, and layer and information about that. A couple of small things you can do, simply select the point cloud once it's in here. You can change point cloud properties. You can change it from true color to grayscale to blue, green, uh, red. This is a pretty flat site, but to have a little fun, we'll do elevation ranging. I can go in and I can set all the elevation ranges uh, to make it look a little bit better. I guess we can uh, we won't worry, worry about that for now. I think you guys get the idea. There's statistics to tell you all about the information. And I'm simply going to click OK. Something you can look at in the future. But it is pretty unique that it would color it by range. So you can see there's some bushes there, and then there's some trees that are different colors that stand out. There's an electrical box here. So I know now to go extrude, I'm sorry, exclude these objects when I go to build my surface, because these are on the ground, and I can narrow those elevations down. What comes with Civil 3D, I believe, is simply um, changing the point density. If you type in 25, you have half the percent of points here, or higher the points in that list. Real-time density, so as you pan and zoom, it does a regen. 100% of the points, so it can look a lot clearer if we want to as well. And again, it doesn't take long, so I can bump that up to 100. And now I'm going to be able to see more points in here. There we go. And now I did an automatic regen so we can see that real clearly. If you do work with this a little bit more, just uh, one last tip here and we'll keep moving. I just want to make sure that you, you go to view, set your viewports, and you have to work with multiple views inside here. And if you work in 3D data, it's kind of the norm. But we want to look at it in plan view. And as we draw the curve or we tell it to extract curve data or we pick the points and information that we need out of here to create uh, in the term I'm looking for, but that, that deliverable, uh, we can look at it in 3D very very quickly. There's the regen, so I can say yes to it, so as I turn the automatic off. Looks like I'm going to have to get a little bit more RAM for my laptop here, but overall does a really good job. And you have to be a little bit patient. There we go. And I just want to zoom in here real quick to show you, uh, again, the curve lines. And depending on the colors that we show, how it's going to look. I guess we could have just did a, a single color or a white would have been fine, too. There we go. As the data comes in, if you get the Autodesk Lab information, you can do more like create the ground surface, extract road features. Again, before you elaborate on this, please talk to us. Uh, there's a better workflow, but this is showing you where Autodesk is going. This is the AutoCAD plugin, so you can start doing some modeling with the point clouds as well if you're working with mechanical rooms. 
uh, and need more information uh, about the point cloud. So again, if you have any questions about the point cloud, hopefully that kind of gave you uh, a general idea of that. And now we're going to move to, I believe the last thing that we're going to talk about is Google Earth. And we're going to end with a fun note because this is a, a lot of fun and very, very simple to use. You hardly have to remember anything. Uh, all we're going to do is take a look here at Civil 3D, simply open up and get a brand new drawing. I'm going to switch back to my desktop. I'm going to start up Google Earth. So this is a separate download. It is free. I'm sure most of you have used Google Earth in the past. If you haven't, catch up with technology. <laughs> this is very cool. So if you're planning a uh, vacation or anything, wherever you want to look in the world, you can just type it in. Uh, let's go ahead just somewhere in Arizona here. Uh, I guess I got Sedona. Let's take a quick look. Sedona. Google Earth is a great tool for conceptual design. The ability to go in here and navigate to wherever the project site is. Don't twist the drawing. Make sure you stay in the plan view area. As long as you're in plan view, you can turn off the labels, you can turn off the icons and the information you see here. But the idea is anywhere that we want to go for conceptual design to get started and we need information quickly, this is a great tool. The problem is the accuracy. You have to be uh, questioning as far as elevation. Our goal here is to pull in the image and also the surface. We have the ability to do either one or both at the same time. The problem is we don't know when it was flown last and we have to understand the accuracy of that information. So again, a great conceptual tool. Don't do too much more with it uh, than that. But if I go to Civil 3D now, I start a brand new drawing. If you simply import Google Earth, we go to the Insert tab, Google Earth. Uh, this allows us to do the image and the surface. There's also a mesh option. As I bring this information in, it's going to prompt me where do I want to locate the image and the surface. And notice in the, the command line it says 0, 0. Okay, That's fine if you don't care where it's at or it's not with the rest of the project data. If you know where it's at, Simply go to the Settings tab, edit your drawing settings, and tell it where we're at in the world. So if I go in here and say USA, Arizona, make sure you, you set the zone, it now knows where we are in the real world. It's no longer going to prompt you to where the coordinates are that you want to drop it. And it will simply import this, use the current coordinate system that you have assigned, and put it right into the drawing. So now we're, we're looking at this image with the surface over top of it. So we can simply take this surface with surface properties, and it automatically took the rendered material, so it draped the image on top of the, the surface as well. So if I take the surface by itself and I go to an object viewer, this is the area that I was at. So now I have conceptual design with the image directly overlaid without knowing pretty much anything about anything except for Google Earth and what, two commands I think I just showed you there. And now in plan view, we can start extruding up buildings. We could have the survey center line going through here. We could show that we're going to design this road. We could show conceptual lane widening. We could put a a new intersection, uh, you know, maybe we're doing a roundabout to do a new design going through here. Whatever the idea is, this is perfect for conceptual design. And I just want to spend a little bit of time showing you how easy it is to utilize this information. I know one of the other questions might be, uh, you know, can you do color images? Yes, there is a workaround for color images. If you're interested in that, uh, shoot me an email afterwards. I'm going to leave you guys uh, with a, want a little more information after these, these training seminars uh, as well. So I, I think that's it. If you guys have uh, questions or anything, please type those in there. And I'll take a look here in just a second as we as we finish up. All right. Well, thank you, Chad. Again, this is Dave Press uh, back with you. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, some support solutions. Obviously, our goal with these uh, online training is to get you as much information as we can in a, in a somewhat limited amount of time. If you have any additional questions, uh, 
please feel free to call us at our office here. Um, or if you have any additional uh, need for training, we'd love to help on that as well. Uh, give myself, uh, Dave Press, or, or Brandon Taylor a call. He's also uh, in our office. And uh, we'd love to help you out with that. Uh, real quick, I just want to, uh, as we wrap up here, talk about a, a very important event for ourselves uh, here at Sterling Systems. Um, we're having Lynn Allen, who's an Autodesk evangelist here on February 16th for a free event. Um, this is a uh, seating is somewhat limited, so if, uh, if you could please register if you're interested in this, uh, attend early. What we're going to do is have Lynn do a couple of presentations, one of them in the future of, of Autodesk products, um, I believe in some tips and tricks, 60, I think it's 60 tips in 60 minutes it's called. Uh, it's, she's a fantastic speaker. She's, uh, not only does she write for Catalyst Magazine, uh, but she also has three books written on Autodesk and, and speaks to about 30,000 people a year. So she is a, definitely a sought-after speaker on any of the Autodesk products. Uh, in conjunction with Lynn, we're also going to have a couple breakout sessions, uh, one on the Revit technologies and uh, one of them on Civil 3D. So, uh, And we're going to wrap, this, uh, wrap the event up with a networking event at the end. And uh, we'd love to have you there, uh, you and your colleagues, if you're interested. There's a link here. Uh, we also sent out an email uh, this morning on uh, registration. And if you have any uh, additional questions, please, again, call the office. We'll get you registered for that. So that's our contact information there, um, as well as our phone numbers. My information and Chad's information is on there as well. We'll leave that up for a couple minutes here so you can write that down. Uh, also, I, I want to just talk about a real quick promotion that we just introduced, and that is 0% financing. Um, we are offering 0% financing on any Autodesk products. Uh, subscription renewals, uh, just about any of the Autodesk products at all, and uh, that's you can have a one seat all the way up to you know hundreds of seats. It really doesn't matter on the size, and uh, one year zero percent, two or three years zero percent financing. So we're pretty excited about that. If uh, you have any questions on that, again, that's our number. Please give us a call. And uh, one last thing, we we will be sending out some evaluations at the end of this. Uh, please take a second and fill those out. There may be five or six questions. But what we're doing with those is uh, we, we will have future training as well. We want to make sure that we're covering the topics that you're most interested in seeing. That gives us an idea of what to uh, schedule for next time, as well as just uh, some creative criticism so that um, so that we can, you know, again, make these the most valuable to you as we, as we possibly can. Uh, thanks again. I believe Chad has some questions, and uh, he'll get to those. And thank you again. Take care. All right, just want to open it up. If you guys have any more questions, uh, feel free to type those in the, the chat window. And again, we can wrap those up. Uh, if, for the uh, person that won the, the Starbucks card, we'll get that out to you today. And for the ones, uh, I apologize for who won part two. I will follow up with you today, uh, hopefully immediately after this event. And I'll shoot you an email, get your contact information, and get those out to you. I didn't forget about anybody. and. Uh, I promise to have a couple more for part four. Yeah, if anybody that joins us live is, is available for those. So I don't see any more questions in the chat window. I want to thank everybody for, for joining us once again today. Uh, again, feel free to type in any of those, those new topics you want to see or send us an email, talk about that. I'm going to go ahead and uh, open it up here if you guys have any live questions, and we'll end it on that. Thank you very much. Hopefully we'll, uh, if anybody has questions, let me know. Hopefully the noise in the background isn't too bad for everybody. What, do, what is your uh, suggestion about I'm oh, sorry about the background noise. You had uh, one of the topics for suggestion? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the... Uh, uh, so what we'll have to do, just due to the, the echo on the phone, if you have some suggestions or questions, you have to type them in here uh, currently or shoot me an email, and I will definitely uh, get back to you here this afternoon. So again, uh, 
I want to thank everybody, and hopefully we'll see you on the part four. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more entertaining and definitely a little bit more advanced. Thanks a lot.